let's turn together in God's Word this morning to Romans 5, and we'll be looking at verses 12 through 17 this morning, Romans 5, verses 12 through 17, and you can find where God's Word reads as follows. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So far the reading from God's word this morning, may he add... It's blessing to our hearts. Today's text deals with the subject of representation. And representation isn't really foreign to us, even though we're not used to perhaps these categories. But in our society, we're organized around the idea of representation. People are elected to different offices and they carry out those offices in the understanding that they will represent their district or they'll represent their their people and so you can have representation like that in the matter of law we send lawmakers to Atlanta or to uh, Washington DC with the understanding that they will represent us in the formation of the laws that 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 form the structure and the fabric of of this nation and our representative goes there knowing that whatever influence he will be able to exert and whatever laws come back to his region his work will serve to be the the normal operation of day for everybody that's in his district so when our representative comes back and he's made a law that we don't like we don't get to exempt ourselves because we weren't the ones who were in washington or we weren't the ones who were in atlanta these men or women they represented us And so all the the people in those districts live under the consequences of that representation. Or you can think about it in the area of economics. Maybe it's even easier to see it in the area of economics. Think about international trade agreements that are formed. And, And a government will send representatives to negotiate these trade agreements. And when the representatives come back, the contents of those trade agreements are binding on all the companies in that nation all the all the companies in that region they don't get to say well i wasn't there for the negotiation i didn't i didn't sign up to for these tariffs i didn't i didn't agree to these taxes no everybody is subject to the consequences of their representative who goes and negotiates this this trade agreement and that's what we're talking about here in this text we're talking about the, repu- the reputation of a group which is bound up in the decisions and actions of a representative, whether those actions and consequences are good or ill. And we talk about that in, in civil government. We, we talk about the federal government. We talk about the government in Washington. It's over the whole of the country, the federal government. And so when it comes to representation in Scripture, as we're going to look at it together in in Romans 5, we also talk about that as federal headship. You don't think about federal headship in terms of uh, it is is in in Washington, D.C. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about federal headship from the Bible. But what we are talking about is analogous. Uh, We're talking about representation, that, that the representative of whatever group we're belonging to has a binding influence and impact on the people that he is uh, represented. And sometimes we, th- we think 
hey, isn't it neat that we have representation in our society and we actually see that same pattern uh, in the Bible? Well, that's getting it backwards. What we see is the pattern of representation in the Bible, which is then copied and worked out in different realms in society. <clears throat> but here we're thinking specifically about representation when it deals with the way that God functions, lives with mankind. And so, so the biblical pattern of representation of, between God and man in different forms is the subject of our verses today. These verses are dealing with representation that leads, leads to guilt and condemnation versus representation that, that comes by way of grace. Which, which leads to salvation, freedom from death. Instead, we receive life. That is what is in view here in this text. And what we see then from these verses that we're considering together is that though man is dead as represented by Adam, God gives him life as he is represented by Christ. So as man is dead when he is represented by Adam, so God gives man life as he is represented by Christ. And to learn that lesson, we're going to divide this text into two parts. First, we're going to look at the sin of Adam. And secondly, we're going to look at the life in Christ. <clears throat> so sin in Adam, life in Christ, <clears throat> as we look at these different representatives of humanity. When it comes to representation, you have to have a point. And I, I don't mean you have to have a purpose. Think shapes. When it comes to representation, you have to have a point, as in a triangle. If you don't have representation, think of your life as being uh, signified by a circle. That's what the story of King Arthur was. He had the round table. What was the function of the round table? It was to show that all the knights were equal. But that's not the case when it comes to representation. When it comes to representation, there must be a point. There, there must be one point that stands out in front of all the masses that are behind that one point. There's a large number of people that make up the base of the triangle. Their representative is the top point of the triangle. And that's what's in view when we speak biblically about representation. And representation in our text comes by way of two very unique men, uh, unique in all of biblical history. The first one is laid out for us in verse 12, even though he's not named. The one man through whom death and sin spreads to everybody. That's one representative. And then the other one is found in verse 15. So you have many who have received the grace by the free gift by the grace of that one man. So there are two points. The one man who leads all into sin and death, and the one man who by grace and righteousness provides life. Now, in the text, each man is identified. And his contribution, or maybe better to say, his consequences for humanity will be spelled out in this text. And Paul as he deals with this topic of representation, begins with bad news. And that really, if you haven't noticed that yet, that is the pattern of Scripture. Scripture begins with bad news, and then it moves to good news. Think about the beginning. God creates, man falls almost immediately. There's a curse that rests on humanity almost immediately. The bad news comes, and then, then you have the description of the bad news in, in, exa in example form in the lives of the patriarchs and, and the people around them. Bad news, people are corrupt, people are sinful, and then later on comes good news. And Paul does the same thing here when, it deals with, when he deals with representation. He begins by giving to us the bad news. He, give, he begins by giving to us this picture of this representative who leads us into death. Now as you read through verse 12, it's one of the most a difficult text to read because the Apostle Paul abandons his thought that he began in verse 12 at the end of verse 12. He never finishes his, 
initial thought in verse 12, and he, he moves on to other things. And so we can come to that interrupted thought and the difficulty of that grammar, and we can become, by default, confused. We look at the rest of the verses, and, and we can't let go of what happened in verse 12, and, and so, so we become confused about what's being said here in this text. But actually, the point of this text is not that uh, obscure. Uh, yes, Paul has an interrupted thought, but, but, but God in his word makes very plain this notion of representation. Of course, he's building on what we've looked at that last Lord's Day in verses 6 through 11, uh, justification and salvation and reconciliation in Christ. And he's really kind of asking the question, how is it that all of humanity needs that justification? How is it that all of humanity is affected uh, by this sin, this sin problem that requires justification by faith alone. Or, as we've repeated many times, but it bears repeating again, justification, meaning this, this notion that our sin is pardoned and that we are counted as righteous because of what Christ has done. Why does everybody need that? It's not by our doing. It's not by our work, and we've seen that that's impossible because of the track record of man in Romans 1 through 3. So, so how is it? That not only we, we begin in this condition of guilt, which is total in all of humanity, how is it that any are able to move from this death of sin and, and into life? And it's, it's trying to address that question. It's a very important question for us to think about how representation solves that problem for us. How it moves us from sin and death and into life and righteousness. Not by, not by our doing, but by representation. And, and so this is a very important question that, that, that touches on sin and, and forgiveness. And when Paul begins with the bad news, he really begins with the one that people object to the most when it comes to representation. People don't like to be represented by Adam because of the things that Adam brings into humanity. Uh, how can we be guilty for something we didn't do? That's often the question. That, that's asked when we think about Adam as our representative. How can man as a whole be guilty of and completely affected by the sin of Adam? Because that's what our text says happens in verse 12. Sin comes into the world through one man. And death comes because of sin. So all the death that you see in the world, all the death that we have experienced has come into the world through one man. One man is responsible for all the death that is in the world because that man's first sin ushered in sin as a whole, making man to be uh, subject to death. It says in verse 12, death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, I've talked about him as Adam. He hasn't been named yet in our text. In verse 12, Adam isn't named. He's not named until verse 14. In verse 14, we can be sure that this one man that Paul's talking about in verse 12 is actually Adam. And so if you look in verse 12, you see Adam, uh, who is the one who is the introduction for the reigning of death. So in verse 12, it says, sin comes into the world through one man and death through that sin. And in verse 14, it points out that, that Adam is the one who initiates that reign of death uh, in, in the world. So the order so far is that one man sins, and because of that sin, because he is a, a representative, death enters into the world. That's Adam and his sin back in Genesis 3 and verse but what we should note, and what's important when it comes to representation, what we should note is that it is not sin generically that affects you. It is not sin generically that has infected all of humanity. It is the sin of Adam specifically, as a representative, that has affected humanity as a whole. How do we know that? Well, if you go back to the Genesis record, Adam is not the first one to sin. Adam is not the first one to sin. When the, the serpent comes to Adam and Eve in the garden, sin has already happened. So Satan is the first one to sin. 
his coming and, and attempting to, te- to, to cause Adam and Eve to fall, to, to, to reject God. That in itself is sinful. Satan is sinning at the beginning. Now, we don't have a timeline for when that happened. We don't know when or, or how that happened. But s- Satan's action at the beginning, when he's tempting Adam and Eve, is in itself sinful. But Satan's sin isn't what corrupted humanity. In fact, Adam isn't even the first human being to sin, is he? If you think again about the Genesis record, who is the first one to eat the fruit? Eve first eats the fruit. Adam eats it later. Now, you could say Adam should have, should have addressed his wife, should have said, no, we're not eating the fruit. The order in Scripture is Satan sins, Eve sins, Adam sins. And yet our text says that it is Adam's sin that ushers death into the world. It is Adam's sin that is effective, or maybe a better word to say is ineffective, uh, for all of humanity. Adam is the representative. Adam is the one who eats the fruit and plunges humanity into sin, and because of his sin, all man dies. He is the first man, and he represents man. And so in verse 12, what you see is that all men sin in relationship to this first man. All men sin because of Adam. On the basis of man's relationship to Adam, all are in sin. All are subject to death. And there is that sense of of being condemned in Adam. Even before you've done anything, because you belong to Adam, like the trade agreements, Adam as your representative has consequences that that form the whole of your life. So Adam's sin, you participate in his guilt. His sin is, is counted as your sin. We talk about that as imputation. His sin is put into your account in some sense. Now, we don't like that. We don't like that because I wasn't there when Adam sinned. I I didn't even get a chance to tell him not to eat that fruit. I didn't get a chance to try to talk him out of it or, or anything like that. But sin, because he is our representative, is counted to us. The universality of human sin is seen and it is seen visibly. We know we belong to Adam. We know we have guilt in Adam because everyone dies. Death is the fruit of sin. Now, Paul in verse 13 and 14 begins to kind of anticipate a a question, an objection maybe. Adam's sin is counted as ours. But in order to have sin, you have to have law. Sin, and the definition of sin, is by necessity connected to law. In our catechism, we talk about sin as as a lack of conforming to or transgression of what? The law of God. You can't talk about sin without talking about the law. And so here in verse 13, he begins to, uh, to show that that there is a universality of sin and guilt in humanity even before the written code, even before Moses. So in verse 13, he he says, sin is in the world before the law was given. He's talking about Moses' law there. And he says, sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, Paul is not saying that there was a time when sin wasn't counted because there was no law. He is actually saying something completely different. He is actually saying there was no time when there was no law because all die. So, there is no guilt where there is no sin and there's no sin when there's no law. Verse 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Why do we have death? Because we have sin. What is sin? Sin is breaking God's law. 
So if there is death in the world, there is a law in the world. And so that's true. Even before it was formally written down in Sinai, that's the mistake we make so often. The law of God didn't come into existence at Sinai. It was just written down at Sinai. And there's many places you can go. You can go to Genesis 26, 5, where it talks about Abraham, 400, 500 years before the law, being righteous in that he kept God's commandments and laws and statutes and ordinances. The law wasn't given, written down, but the law was there. And so the same thing is true here in verse 14. There was no written down law, but there was sin, which requires a law. And because that sin against God's law, there was death in the world, even from Adam all the way through to Moses. The effect of sin is seen even before the law is written down. Before the law is written down, the law is known. Before the law is written down, the effect of breaking the law is seen. There is a cause and effect that Paul is referring to here in verse 14. Where there is smoke, there is fire. Where there is death, there is sin. Where there is a skunk, there's a foul order, odor. Where there is sin, there's death. It's the same thing. There is sin, even though the law is not written down, and that sin can be recognized because death reigned from Adam on, even before the law was written down. Even though man's sin isn't like Adam's in the sense that we are not representatives like Adam is, all have inherited his sin and the consequence that comes with it. And so Adam is a type, it says in verse 14. He's a type of the one who is to come. Adam was like the one who would follow after him. Adam was like the promise, not in every way, but in some ways he was like the promise. So, for example, Adam is like the one who is to come in Genesis 3.15 who would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. How is he like him? He's like him because he is the point. He stands at the head of the group. He is the representative of this group. Or Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 talks about the one who is to come who will be a prophet like Moses who will speak to the people. And Adam is a negative representative in that way. Paul's aim is to begin with the bad news, this sin that we have in Adam, death that we have in Adam, and, and to move then to the good news. And that's what he does when he begins talking about the life that we have in Christ in verses 15 through 17. So Adam's failure as the head of humanity leads to death and sin and so on. And we can see that in our world. We don't have to look around too carefully to find out if there's still sin and, and death in the world. The, the effects of sin, even prior to death, are not hard to find. We have flooded, we, have, we are, are constantly being bombarded with reports of immorality of all kinds in our nation. There, there is violence and murder. There's a reason why we have locks on our doors. We are faced with deceit. People who should be concerned with protecting their fellow man is intent instead on defrauding him. And that's what we see in our media feeds. That's what we see when we, when we try to find out what's going on in the world. We're flooded with these accounts of bad news. All of these things come from our representative. They come from Adam. But it is not just man that imitates Adam's action. So, so it's not just that, that man is born of Adam and so he kind of does the things that Adam does. It's not just that man imitates him. It's that man is him. Man is corrupt in his nature. His essence is polluted. He has his guilt. He has his sin. As is Adam, so is man. From the fall on, Adam's sin is, is woven into the very fabric of humanity. 
But Romans 5 also tells us about a different representative. It tells us about uh, representatives who has effects that are stronger, more powerful, more beautiful, more precious than anything that Adam can oblige us to. The work of the second representative causes joy and thanksgiving for all who belong to him. To be related to Adam means you inherit guilt. To be related to the second representative is altogether different. It says in verse uh, 15 and 16, the, the free gift is not like the trespass. Uh, in Adam's representation, many died. The one man, Jesus Christ, the, the second representative, he brings a free gift of grace. Adam's trespass is death. The second man brings a gift. It says in our text that it abounded. It is readily available. Sometimes uh, people in the past have used the word promiscuous to talk about the gospel. It is, it is available very freely. And it comes by grace, this gift. The grace of one man, Jesus Christ. And his free grace is not like Adam's guilt. Adam's gift to you <clears throat> is rotten. Adam's gift is like somebody gave you a box of two-week-old trash and you open it up and it's covered in maggots. That's Adam's gift to humanity. But Christ's gift is a very different sort. It's, it's beautiful. Adam gives condemnation. Christ gives justification. The work of our first representative leads to sin, which leads to the reign of death, it says in verse 17. Well, the work of the second representative gives us righteousness and the reign of life. And for both of these circumstances, representation is the key. Through Adam's representation, he binds all who belong to him to the condition of guilt and condemnation and death. But by God's grace, the second representative gives you a free gift of righteousness, the pardon of sin, and life in our second representative, Christ. And now here is the dilemma that humanity faces. The dilemma is we all we all belong to Adam. We all inherit his guilt. And you tell people that and they say, well, that's not fair. I didn't ask to be born. I didn't participate in Adam's sin. I wasn't there. How can God condemn me for sin that was committed 6,000 years ago? Well, my friend... It is not up to God to conform to my sense of fairness. It's not His responsibility to structure His ways according to what I perceive to be good and fair. God is Creator. And this is how it is. This is how He has established it. God made Adam from the dust and made him man's representative. And as a result of His representation... He has imputed, he has credited, we have imputed, credited his sin to us. And God is free to order that world and the consequences for sin any way he likes because he is the one who made it. See, God is free. He, he doesn't need your permission. Don't we talk about him as God? Doesn't that make him different than we are? Now, people don't, don't like that. But it's not up to Romans to conform itself to our beliefs, but we are to submit our beliefs to Romans. And that's truly wonderful because God describes himself as supremely merciful to man. Where, where Adam imputes sin, the one man, Jesus Christ, imputes righteousness and life. God provides a gift that supersedes all the things that people complain about in Adam. 
Now, when it comes to being imputed with Christ's righteousness, how many people are walking around grumbling about that? It's not fair. I didn't die on the cross. I didn't suffer the eternal wrath of God. No, it's not fair that I would receive those benefits, these gifts from His hands. They don't do that because when imputation works in our favor, we like it. When it doesn't work in our favor, we grumble against it. But the reality is, because salvation by Christ's work is virtuous, then condemnation by Adam is virtuous too. They both are built on the principle of representation, this federal headship that we began talking about. So how does federal headship and that theology help you? It's more than just a term, my friends. This is something that should affect you. This theology should not be something that you store here, It should be something that affects you here. So how does it? Well, it makes you consider well your state in Adam. Paul, in this text, the Bible as a whole, gives bad news first. That's where we want to think in terms of our response to this theology. What is your state in Adam? Well, your state in Adam has two parts. It's marked by sins of action. We talk about that as actual sin, Sometimes it's, we, I, I hesitate to use that because it sounds like it's, act, it's really sin. The other stuff isn't really sin. We're going to see that they're both sin. But our sins of action, our, our actual sin. Adam sinned, and from that flows all your sinful behavior. The reason you see parents having to take their children out of this room is not because they've trained them. Hey, at some point in the service, you've got to stand up and make a scene and fuss and disobey that's not what happens children do that on their own i never had to teach any of my children to disobey me and neither did my parents have to teach me to disobey them that is in all of humanity the 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 sin that breaks up the peace of your home it's it's in it flows out of your nature it's the result of adam's sin the the sin that pollutes our society with wickedness that we can't even describe it's, it's the result of Adam's sin. The sin that causes churches to divide and splinter and fragment, that's the result of Adam's sin. Those are the sinful actions of man. So we call them actual sins. And, and they flow from Adam. And you have them. I have them. But there's also your state in Adam that is grounded in original sin. It would be bad enough if we talked about the sinful things that we did because Adam uh, was our father, because he was our representative. But if it was just our sinful actions, in some sense, we would have hope. We could pray for a grace period. We could pray for a period where there was no awareness of sinful action. Maybe we call it the age of accountability. And, and, And we hold that people who are who are in that age group are innocent because they don't understand the law. But how do you explain the death of children then? Why are there miscarriages? Why is there sudden infant death syndrome? If there's innocence before the law, and if all we're talking about is action, why is death still showing up in those circumstances? Why is it that parents carry tiny little coffins and bury their little children in the ground? Doesn't death come through sin? And if there is no sin, how can there be death? The reason these things are is because the sin of Adam extends to more than simply what we do. It extends to who we are. It extends to our being. Our larger catechism talks about this. Question answer 22 asks, if all of mankind fell in Adam's first transgression? Here's the answer. The covenant being made with Adam as a public person, not for himself only, but for his posterity, 
all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation sinned in him and fell with him in that first transgression. What does that mean? That means before you take your first breath, as soon as you are conceived, because you are born of Adam, you have inherited his guilt. You are sharing in the common condition of all human beings who have as their representative this one man, Adam, who sinned and fell. That is a gloomy picture. That every single one of us, before we are born, are joined to Adam in that sin. But this text also encourages us to consider well your state in Christ. So not only thinking of the, the terrors of belonging to Adam, but the blessings of belonging to Christ. In Scripture, after bad news comes good news. And so, do you know yourself to be sinful? Do you know yourself to be corrupt apart from Christ? Do you know that you have no hope without Christ? Do you know that you're born of Adam, of ordinary generation? You've come into the world the same way everybody else has, a mom and a dad, whether they're together or not, right? That's how we come into the world. And so you are an Adam. You can't help it. But there is a free gift that is promised to you in this text. And it is justification and life in Christ. It is the opposite of the foul and dark existence of man. Philosophers have, have described man's existence as nasty and brutish and short. But what is nasty and brutish and short in Adam is fragrant in Christ. What is dark in Adam is made light in Christ. What is dead in Adam is made alive in Christ. But to have those gifts, you must be in Christ. He must be your representative. Adam is your default representative. And we're all born of him. So you uh, are inheriting the curses of Adam because you were born of him, because of your birth. And so when it comes to representation, it is inherited by birth. We inherit death and destruction through Adam. And so you must inherit Christ's blessing by birth as well. Now, here's the trick. The birth of Adam is a natural birth. It happens to all of us. But to be born into Christ is supernatural. In John's Gospel, in the first chapter, it talks about the rejection of, of Christ, the creator of heaven and earth, rejected, came to his own people. His own people didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, believed in his name, gave the right to become children of God. And then he goes on to define what the children of God are. He says the children are go of God, in verse 13 of John 1, they are not born of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. How do you have Christ as your representative? Through your rebirth. You must have a spiritual birth not of the flesh, but you must be birthed by the Holy Spirit. And that comes to you by faith. Would you be numbered among those who are justified and cleansed and resurrected? Then you must believe in Christ. You must be born again. You must have a new representative, a new federal head. You must know yourself to be pardoned because of his work, not because of your own. And he will not lead you to destruction as Adam did, but he will lead you to salvation, adopted by faith. Without faith, your only representative is Adam. And what he has sowed, you will reap. So the Bible comes to us with this twofold representation. 
And it's a book that gives us tremendous comfort as we think about these things. The book is focused on comforting the ones who grieve and who mourn, primarily over their sin. In Psalm 23, it talks about the Lord being our shepherd. It reminds us that we don't lack anything in Him, that He makes us to lie down in peaceful places. It talks about it as green pastures, how we are led beside still waters where we can be refreshed, that God is the one who restores my soul. My soul needs restoration because my representative is Adam. And I live in his world. And I have his mind. And I have his flesh. But when Christ is my representative, I have all these things that God has promised. Without Christ covering, there is death throughout my entire being. But with Christ, by God's grace, you receive blessing and life through the second Adam. He gives you the free gift which triumphs so gloriously over the defeats that we have in Adam. Rather than death reigning in you and over you, you reign in life by the righteousness you have in faith. Let's pray together.